Welcome back to week six of our class. In this lecture, we're going to cover the American pioneers of psychology. They were active in the 1800s and 1900s. Psychology in the United States evolved much like it did in Europe. We will learn about some of the things that happened in the United States in this time period. Let's start with the zeitgeist of American psychology in the 1800s. Recall that the word zeitgeist refers to the spirit of the times, the climate of the times. In the early 1800s in the United States, psychology was mostly philosophical. No experiments were being conducted. Then in the mid 1800s, higher education expanded in our country and so did American psychology. In the late 1800s, psychology mirrored Europe's psychology, which was more scientific than it had ever been before. This is thanks to Wilhelm Wundt, the founder of psychology, and to Charles Darwin, the promoter of evolutionary thinking. In the 1800s, psychology was dominated by philosophy, religion, and what we call faculty psychology. At the time, there were only a handful of universities in the United States. Harvard University was established in 1636, the University of Pennsylvania in 1740. Many of the professors at the time were also Protestant ministers. If you were a student in the 1840s and you were interested in studying psychology, the first class that you would take was called mental philosophy. It was the equivalent of today's general psychology classes. Psychology was not scientific. It was not experimental just yet. No research labs were available for professors or their students, and no academic journals had been established yet. Faculty psychology was created by Scottish philosophers. They believed that the mind was made up of various parts, and they called these parts faculties. These parts interact to produce our behavior, so they were on to something. Intellectual faculties included things like memory, reasoning, judgment. Active faculties included free will and emotions. They said that any theory of the mind should investigate both types of these faculties, intellectual and active. You can see that these faculties match some of the major topics that we study in psychology today. Later in 1858, Thomas Upham published American Psychology's first textbook, Elements of Mental Philosophy. You see that phrase again, mental philosophy. That is how psychology was defined in the early 1800s. By observing behavior, some philosophers tried to identify the principles that explain these faculties. Again, experiments were not yet being conducted. At most, those interested in psychology observed others and then simply speculated about the processes that might be at play. They said the mind is like a muscle. We've heard it compared to computers, to machines. Now we have a group comparing the mind to a muscle. Mental health, according to them, means strengthening the intellectual faculties, things like reasoning, so you can overpower the active faculties, like emotion. An example of this might be emotional intelligence. Following socially acceptable expressions of behavior requires intellectual faculties. It requires us to use that part of our mind to overcome our instinctual, our impulsive reactions to certain situations. At the time, of course, we didn't have the term emotional intelligence. It's just an example of how the mind is like a muscle. Moving on to the mid 1800s. At this time, higher education was undergoing drastic changes and these changes influenced how the field of psychology developed. Immigration brought new ways of thinking and new ways of doing. As highly educated, highly skilled individuals like doctors 
teachers, entrepreneurs, traveled to the United States in large numbers. As the population increased, the number of high schools increased, which meant the number of colleges needed to increase. The need for college instructors then increased. And as a result of all of these different things, we can say that the demand for higher education increased substantially in the mid 1800s. To address the increased demand for higher education, the federal government put a new program into place. In 1862, they established the Morrill Land Grant Act, which gave every state 30,000 acres on which to build higher education institutions. They had to use the land for that purpose. In 1819, we had 49 colleges. In 1859, we had 289 colleges. 1899, we had 721 colleges. And then by 1934, we had nearly 1,000 universities in the United States. The red dots on this map identify which universities were established by this land grant. Then in the mid to late 1800s, colleges for women and African Americans were established because at the time, many of the existing universities prohibited minorities from attending, sometimes from even setting foot on campus. By the early 1900s, there were nearly 120 women's colleges in the United States. Vassar College was established in 1861 and Smith College in 1871. By the 1940s, there were nearly 100 universities that had been created specifically for African American students. Examples include Howard University. It was established in 1867. Harris Stowe State University, which is in downtown St. Louis, it was established in 1857. In the late 1800s, universities began to emphasize research and the creation of new ideas instead of replicating old studies and repackaging those ideas as new ideas. They did this by recruiting the best students from across the globe and they would offer these students fellowships, which often included tuition waivers and monthly stipends in exchange for those students working for the university. We still do this today. Many master's degree and PhD students in psychology pay for their education by working for the university while they're going to school. The university provides a job opportunity either in a research lab or working for a professor in the classroom as a teaching assistant. And in exchange, the students don't have to pay tuition and get a little extra money every month to live on. As a result, religion and science began to separate. Professors were no longer acting as priests and many of the professors supported Darwin's idea of evolution. In the last 20 years or so of the 1800s, American psychology began to reflect the new psychology. It looked more like Europe's psychology. It was more scientific it relied on Wundt's introspection, and it incorporated different types of evolutionary thinking. This dominance would only last up until World War I, however, when behaviorism took over and became the dominant force in psychology. Now that we know a little bit more about what was going on in the country at the time, let's explore William James and some of his contributions to the field. William James is one of the most important people in psychology's history. He is considered the first American psychologist and the father of American psychology. Contrast this with Wundt, who is the father of psychology in general. Although James is considered a psychologist, he wrote about many different topics. Epistemology, which is the study of knowledge, education, metaphysics, 
religion, and mysticism. James was born in New York City to a wealthy family. His grandfather was a successful businessman. His whole family actually was full of brilliant, well-educated people. Throughout his life, they encouraged him to learn. In fact, he made 16 trips to Europe throughout his life. He had the means, he had the money, but he was also encouraged by the people in his family to explore the world on his own and learn things for himself. From an early age, James valued education and he would go on to study and work at one of the most prestigious universities in the country. In 1865, he traveled to the Amazon jungle with his biology professor, Louis Agassiz, and found his own evidence of Darwin's theory of natural selection. By the time he finished medical school in 1869, he was well-traveled and he spoke several languages. He trained as a physician, but he never actually practiced medicine. Instead, he pursued his interests in psychology and then philosophy. In the 1870s, he traveled to Germany and learned about experimental physiology from leading physiologists like Helmholtz. In 1875, James began teaching the first psychology course and created an experimental psychology lab at Harvard University. He created this lab only to demonstrate lecture concepts. He was not conducting experiments in the lab at this time. Like many psychologists at the time, he preferred introspection and was critical of what he called the brass instrument method, which included things like reaction time studies, psychophysics, and surveys. Brass instruments referred to the instruments that we would use to conduct some of these physiological studies. They were often made of brass. He preferred introspection. He did not like these other methods, the methods that we use today. While he was at Harvard, he also supervised the first doctorate in psychology. It was earned by G. Stanley Hall in 1878. We will talk more about Hall in a few minutes. James also taught several other leading psychologists, including Mary Witten Calkins. We'll talk about her at the end of the lecture, E.L. Thorndike, and he taught Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president. In 1890, James published one of American psychology's most famous textbooks, The Principles of Psychology. In 1892, he published a condensed version called Psychology, the Briefer Course. He described a variety of methods in these books, including introspection, experiments, and questionnaires. Remember, though, that he preferred introspection, so it definitely takes up a larger part of his first book. Instead of trying to dissect consciousness into its elements, like the structuralists were trying to do at the time, and we'll learn more about the structuralists in a few weeks. Instead of trying to identify the elements of the mind, James was more interested in the functions of these elements. Why does the mind operate the way that it does? He believed, based on Darwin's work and based on his observations in the Amazon jungle, he believed that our mind, specifically things like our habits, have evolved over time to help us adapt to the environment and help us make better decisions. Instead of reacting to every little thing that we see, hear, and do, our minds have evolved to allow us to live our lives without paying attention to every little thing like animals have to do. For instance, walking, eating, sleeping, we don't have to think very much about these things when we do them. James reasoned that the reason we don't have to think about them is because our minds have evolved to allow us to adapt to our environment. 
he also had some revolutionary ideas about the pursuit of happiness. He believed that the rational part of our minds can never believe that life has meaning. That idea that life has a purpose and we're all here for a reason, that comes from the irrational part of our minds, the emotional part. But he urged us to think and act as if it does. He said that in order to be a happy, healthy individual, you have to make yourself believe that life has meaning. By fantasizing, by dreaming about our futures, we create purpose for ourselves. By actively working towards these fantasies, dreams, goals, we then create our own happiness. In James's mind, the pursuit of happiness is something that you have to do for yourself. Here's a quote from James that I think sums up his idea about the pursuit of happiness quite well. Believe that life is worth living and your belief will help create the fact. In 1894, he served as the third president of the American Psychological Association. In 1894, James served as the third president of the APA, the American Psychological Association. In the late 1800s, he helped establish a new philosophy in psychology. We call it functionalism. He would have never considered himself to be a functionalist, but he is considered its founder. Functionalism was a philosophy that opposed structuralism. Functionalists were concerned about the function of the mind and its elements and its parts. Why is the mind the way that it is? He believed consciousness was personal, individualized, different for different people, selective. We only pay attention to certain things in our environment and ignore other things, and that it is ever-changing, that the information that is in our conscious awareness is constantly changing and being replaced by different information, depending on what we're looking at, what we're listening to, what we're doing. He believed the subconscious processed information just like the conscious processes information. In his Principles of Behavior book, he attempted to describe some of these subconscious processes. He believed that those situations where you have information that's just on the tip of your tongue, you can't remember someone's name, but it's, it's almost there. He believed that in those moments, the subconscious was active and the conscious was active and they were sort of fighting over how that information is going to be paid attention to. He also said that our habits are being controlled by subconscious processes. We don't have to think about walking, eating, sleeping, drinking. Those are things that just happen. Our subconscious, according to James, helps us take care of those actions, which then frees up consciousness to pay attention to all the other important things in the environment. Now that you know more about the father of American psychology, let's talk about the son of American psychology, G. Stanley Hall. Granville Stanley Hall is known as the son of American psychology because he was trained by William James and because he promoted the field after graduating. Hall was born in Massachusetts to loving parents. They nurtured his love of learning and encouraged him to develop an open mind, much like James's parents had done for him during his childhood. In 1878, Hall earned America's first PhD in psychology from Harvard University. His dissertation was supervised by William James. After reading one of Wundt's books, Hall became interested in psychology, and he traveled to Germany in 1879 to learn more about physiological psychology, which is what it was called at the time in Germany. Unfortunately, he was not impressed with Wundt, and he was not impressed with introspection. Instead, he realized that he was more interested in human development 
and evolutionary thinking than he was in the traditional type of psychology that was being promoted in Europe. Clearly, Charles Darwin had had an influence on both Hall and William James. Hall openly expressed his support for eugenics. He wrote about eugenics. He was part of several organizations that promoted eugenics. Recall that this is the idea that intelligence can be bred, that if we select and isolate the most highly intelligent individuals in a society, encourage them to reproduce, then the resulting children will be more intelligent than the rest of society. After Hall returned to the United States, he began teaching at John Hopkins University and then eventually Clark University. Both of these universities were hot spots for psychology at the time, and they still are today. In 1883, he created the first experimental psychology lab in the United States, and he did this at John Hopkins University. Wundt gets credit for the first lab in the world, 1879. Hall gets credit for the first American lab, 1883. Hall's studies covered a wide range of topics, many of which fall under the heading of genetic psychology, which is the study of the development of behavior of consciousness over time. Again, notice the impact of Darwin's ideas on the work that Hall was doing, on how he was promoting the field at the time. In 1887, he published the first academic journal in the United States, the American Journal of Psychology. Journals were important at the time, and they still are today, because journals allow us to share information with other people in the field. This is a photo of Hall's lab at John Hopkins University. Remember, it was the first American experimental psychology lab. He then moved to Clark University and became its first president in 1889. As the top leader at the university, he emphasized the use of science and evidence across all disciplines, not just psychology. Other universities were beginning to do this too, so it wasn't that unusual, but he is considered a transformational, a revolutionary individual because he brought the newest ideas to Clark University. He also established another experimental psychology lab at Clark. This one had the best equipment and access to lots of resources. The studies at Clark focused on questions in human development, abnormal psychology, comparative psychology, comparative psychologists study animals. They compare rats to rats and they compare rats to mice. Under the direction of Edmund Sanford, the lab produced important research throughout the 1890s, including some of the first maze studies. Uh, rats and mice were dropped into these mazes and their behavior was observed and recorded and analyzed. In the early 1900s, the graduate school at Clark University was very popular, influential, and attracted students from all over the world. They used fellowships in order to do this, in order to attract students. As he was busy doing all of these other things, he got the idea to create a group of like-minded psychologists. In 1892, he created the American Psychological Association, the APA, and he was its first president. The group was focused on the profession of psychology, on promoting the profession, attracting students, spreading the word about the work that psychologists were doing. Today, it has a leadership structure. There are membership dues that must be paid every year the organization holds an annual conference and they publish research. He was also a pioneer in developmental psychology. 
He wrote several textbooks about the different stages of life. He focused on adolescence and described this as a time of storm and stress. He also identified some of the developmental changes that occur as we age, specifically as we near older adulthood. He gained information about these stages by reflecting on his own life and taking notes about some of the things that he was experiencing. In 1909, Hall organized a conference at Clark University, and he invited Sigmund Freud to attend, to speak. He chose Freud because they actually had similar interests. Hall and Freud were both interested in human development, sexuality, and abnormal psychology, abnormal personality. This made Hall a good fit for Freud's psychoanalysis. When Hall initially heard about Freud's new ideas, which he came up with in the late 1890s, early 1900s, when Hall heard about these ideas, he was really excited. He thought this could be the next big thing in psychology. He invited Freud to give a talk at this conference. It was Freud's first and only trip to the United States of America. He would never return again. Freud believed this invitation to speak at a conference in the United States was proof that his ideas were valuable and that he should continue doing his work. This is the iconic photo of the conference at Clark University in 1909. You can see Hall is standing in the center. Freud is standing to the right of him, your right. James is also in the front row. He's the one holding a hat. And you may recognize some of the other names. Young is standing next to Freud with the green circle around his face. At the time, Young was Freud's protege, but in several years, they separate and have a falling out. In purple, we have Titchener. He was the father of structuralism, which was popular at the time, but eventually falls out of favor and is replaced by other philosophies in psychology. You might recognize some of the other names, Hayes, Cattell, Goddard, Meyer. All of these individuals were playing a big role in psychology at the time. I want to show you this picture for one other reason. Notice that there are no females in this group. At the time, it was not acceptable for women to attend some of these conferences. They were men-only conferences, which of course creates problems for career development. If the greatest minds are at this conference, but you're not allowed to go, you aren't going to be able to network and learn like the people who were invited, who were allowed to, to attend. Now you know more about both the father of American psychology and the son of American psychology. Let's turn our attention to some of the contributions made by minority members at the time. We'll start by exploring some of the barriers that they experienced in order to contribute to the field. So we know that women and African Americans gained access to higher education in the mid to late 1800s, yet they still faced many, many barriers when it came to pursuing their careers. Most universities at the time were limited to middle class to upper class males, specifically European Protestant males. Gender, racial, ethnic, religious, and even socioeconomic minorities were actively discouraged from attending colleges. We're going to talk about four of these barriers. The first one is explicit prohibition. Both undergraduate and graduate programs did not accept minority members. End of story. In some cases, women could complete the program, but without earning the degree, without earning the diploma. The second obstacle was prevailing stereotypes. Many Americans at the time believed minority members were intellectually inferior to the majority members. 
and thus those minority members could not benefit from a higher education. Let's take a look at some of these stereotypes in more detail. There were two prominent ideas about women at the time that prevented them from being able to access higher education. The notion of the women's sphere and the variability hypothesis. The first one is the idea that once a month during women's menstrual cycles, they are incapacitated. They are less intelligent than they are during the rest of the month. The second idea was that men have greater variability when it comes to intelligence than women. Both of these ideas are, of course, false. We know that today. In fact, many of us look at these two ideas and we shake our head, right? But at the time, these ideas were held by the majority of Americans. Most people thought this way without ever giving it a second thought. So women were thought to be best suited as caregivers. Their first priority was to get married and have children. If they couldn't get married and have children, then they were expected to live with their parents and take care of their parents and any other siblings that were still in the house at the time. A few years later, in 1897, Stetson studied the memory of 1,000 students in Washington, D.C. He compared the memory of Black students to the memory of white students. What he found is that Black and white children did not differ in their ability to memorize poems. The scores were not different. They were very similar, in fact. He interpreted this to mean that memorization must be a poor indicator of intelligence, misinterpreting the results in order to fit their bias, their stereotypes about a particular group. The third barrier faced by minority students in the United States in the 1800s was lack of opportunities in undergraduate programs. Minority colleges offered psychology courses but not enough to adequately prepare undergraduate students for graduate school. For those of you who are interested in graduate school, you know that research experience is important to your application. The same was true in the 1800s. A lack of research experience and a lack of exposure to coursework meant that minority students were less likely to be accepted into graduate programs. Then, after graduation, minority students faced yet another challenge, lack of job opportunities. They often taught at minority colleges where the benefits were considerably less, where the salary was less, and where they had less access to research labs and equipment. In the early days of psychology, it was extremely important for PhD professors to publish publish, publish. That's still true today, but even more so in the early 1900s. Because minority students did not have access to the same resources, even after graduation, it was more difficult for them to publish, 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 which then made it even more difficult for them to be able to transfer to universities like Harvard and Clark. African Americans with graduate degrees ended up teaching at historically Black colleges and universities. In this last section of the lecture, we're going to learn about some of the women psychologists and some of the Black psychologists who contributed to psychology in the late 1800s and early to mid 1900s. We'll start with Mary Witten Culkins. She studied with some of the greatest minds in psychology, but was never awarded a doctorate that she clearly earned. In 1905, she was the first woman to be elected president of the APA. As her interests shifted from psychology to philosophy, she became the first woman president of the other APA, the American Philosophical Association. She did this in 1918. As an undergraduate student, Calkins studied at Smith College, one of the universities that was established for women. 
Then she took classes with William James at Harvard University around the time that he published his famous book, The Principles of Psychology in 1890. She was impressed with James, but he was not an experimentalist, and she was. Even though she was allowed to take classes with James, she was not allowed to earn a degree from Harvard. She finished her dissertation, she presented it, the board passed her, but Harvard University never awarded her the degree. Still to this day, she does not, even after death, she does not have the degree. She also worked with the famous Hugo Munsterberg, who was a pioneer in applied psychology. After Harvard University, she learned about experimental psychology from Edmund Sanford at Clark University in the lab that G. Stanley Hall had set up. One of her greatest contributions is her creation of a memory procedure called paired associates learning. She examined a variety of different factors that influence memory, frequency, recency, vividness, primacy, and found that frequency was the most important for developing strong associations. The idea that the more frequently you review something, the more frequently you practice it, the better you are able to remember it. Here's an example of the earliest version of her invention. During the study phase, participants are asked to associate two images together. So AB would be the star and the circle. Participants are expected to memorize these matches and then they're tested over those matches later on. This procedure has evolved and today we have a similar version that uses the computer to administer the test. Christine Ladd Franklin was an American psychologist and mathematician. She was one of the first women to be elected president of the APA, and she was also well known for her social activism. She protested the lack of opportunities in both higher education and post-graduation. She was angry with Titchener, who we will learn about in a few weeks. She was angry with him because he would not allow her to join his super private group of psychologists. She wrote him letters demanding that he allow her to attend. She wrote letters to other famous psychologists like Calkins. Lad Franklin also studied at a women's college. She earned her PhD in math and logic in 1882 from John Hopkins University. But like Calkins, she did not receive the degree right away. Fortunately, years later, Hopkins eventually prints the diploma and sends it to her. Her contributions to psychology were mostly philosophical because she didn't have access to an experimental lab. Luckily, Muller and Helmholtz allowed her to use their labs. She would help them with their work, and when she finished helping them, she would conduct her own experiments. One of her greatest contributions was her theory of color vision, which she published in the late 1920s. She focused on the evolution of color vision. She believed that achromatic vision appeared first, the ability to see in black and white. Over time, eyes adjusted to the world and blue-yellow sensitivity appeared second. Then the red-green sensitivity developed. Another reason this is important is because you can once again see the influence of Darwin's theory of natural selection. Margaret Washburn was another American psychologist. She is best known for being the first woman to receive a PhD in psychology. She did this in 1894. She was Edward Titchener's first PhD student at Cornell University. She was also president of the APA in 1921, which gives you some idea of how influential she was. 
in order to become president of the APA, you really have to be on top of your game and making large contributions to the field. Washburn studied both humans and animals, and she had several graduate students who worked with her. She promoted their work and ended up publishing more than 70 articles in her lifetime. She explored perception, visual imagery, empathy, helping behavior, and consciousness in general, awareness. She published a book about comparative psychology in 1908. She focused on her animal studies and animal studies conducted by other individuals. Let's fast forward a few years to the early 20th century. Frances Sumner was the first African American to earn a PhD in psychology. He did this in 1920. He had started studying at Clark University with G. Stanley Hall in 1917, but he was then drafted to serve in World War I in 1918. While in Germany, he learned to speak German, which would help him later on in life. He was then discharged in 1990 after the war ended. It ended in 1918, but he didn't get to come home until 1919. He returned to Clark University and finished his PhD the next year. At the time, it was difficult for black psychologists to find work outside of minority colleges. One of the things that Sumner did was start writing abstracts for two of the most popular academic journals. And these journals are still popular today. In his lifetime, he wrote more than 2,000 abstracts. 2,000 abstracts, can you imagine? That's a lot of abstracts. After earning his PhD, he taught at several smaller colleges. He taught psychology and German. Eventually, he was hired by Howard University in Washington, D.C. to chair the psychology department. During his time there, he created an influential bachelor's program and later a popular master's degree program. His research focused on racial bias, religion, and justice. During his time as chair of the department, he supervised hundreds of students. Two of his students, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, would go on to publish some influential research in the mid-1900s. So let's end the lecture with these two individuals. Kenneth B. Clark and Mamie Phipps Clark were American psychologists. They earned their master's degrees from Howard University under Francis Sumner's guidance. Kenneth graduated in 1935, Mamie graduated in 1939. They were married in between their graduation dates in 1937. In 1940, Kenneth became the first African American to earn Columbia University's PhD in psychology. Several years later, he became the first African American tenured professor of psychology at City College of New York, where he would stay until he retired in 1975. In 1971, several years before he retired, he was the first African-American president of the American Psychological Association. During that same time, in 1943, Mamie was the second African-American to earn a Columbia University PhD in psychology, right after her husband. In 1946, the Clarks established Northside Center, a community counseling center for New York City families. Together, they studied racial bias in education and other topics in both psychology and social psychology. In the 1930s, K through 12 schools were heavily segregated. The Clarks were interested in the impact of this racial segregation on children's well-being, so they conducted their famous doll studies. They compared the self-perceptions of black and white students in Washington, D.C.'s public school system with 
those of black and white children in New York's integrated schools. So they compared the results from a segregated school with an integrated school. Their results were published in 1939 and again in 1940. What they did was bring in individual students into a room and show them two dolls, a light-skinned doll and a dark-skinned doll. And they would ask the children a series of questions. For instance, they asked them to identify the doll that most people prefer. Identify the doll that you prefer. When they asked these questions, the black children chose the white doll. The white children chose the white doll, but these responses were less popular, were less frequent in the integrated schools. Based on their research, they concluded that racial segregation in education harms children's identity development, including the way they see themselves and the way they think other people see them. Nearly 15 years after they published these landmark studies, they were referenced and influential in the Supreme Court's decision in the Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, 1954. 